from the campus of Washington Adventist University. And I probably need about 30 minutes to drive there. So we'll, we'll be done. We'll be done before that. Okay? So you relax with that. What a blessing to be. Yes, for us, it's a homecoming uh, to come back to Atherton after uh, all these years. And good to see each of you and to see new faces. Oh, now you can hear me. Okay. That's just, I think the first part was censored, right? I, I don't know what happened. I uh, want to thank your pastor, Pastor Frank Zolman, for the invitation to come and to speak here. Uh, we're blessed with having his wife in the Spencerville Church where Ruth and I go when we are in town. And I want to thank Linda Elliott for her usual organizational skills, putting things together. Let's give her a hand for that, would you? Okay. Yeah. Mary was a teenage girl of about 15 years old. And... Uh, she wrote a letter to her father. Mary actually wrote it in cursive letters. How many of you know what cursive letters are? I understand that's not being taught anymore. Cursive letters. She wrote a letter to her father. I have a copy of it. And I'm not going to read the whole letter. We don't have time to do that. But the part that I want to read is when she says to her father, P.S., the letter is over, but there's something very important she wants to tell him. She says to him in her letter, bring us home a loaf of German bread. Ours is awful sour. We have a loaf which I guess will last the week. When, the way she writes it, it will last a week. I wish it wouldn't last a week, but I guess it will. She, Mary, was Mary Andrews, the daughter of Jay and Andrews, the first official Seventh Adventist missionary to go from the United States overseas. Jane Andrews was a widower. His wife had died, but he and his, their two children, Mary and Charles, left the United States, went to Britain, went to the continent to begin the Seventh Adventist work in Europe. He was at that time holding evangelistic meetings in Germany. And for some reason, the children didn't like the Swiss bread. I don't know why. I've been to Switzerland. I think their bread is okay, but they didn't like for it. And so she was pleading with her father to bring some bread from Germany. The church, our church, your church, our Adventist church worldwide, is made up of all kinds of people from all kinds of countries, languages, age groups. We are truly an international church. Today, you have designated it as International Sabbath Day. I commend you for that. It's wonderful that you have done that. And I want to leave with you really just two points. Two points. I know in college and seminary tell us to have a three-point sermon, but you, I understand, are a very receptive group. Two points will do today. <laughs> During lunch, you can figure out the third one if you want to. All right? I want to leave two points with you. And that is, we have different languages, we look differently, we have different views, we eat different food, but I want to tell you something, we have to focus on what is really, really important. What is really important. And Jay and Andrews was one of those people who figured out what is important. On one occasion, he received a letter from Germany from a group of people who were Sabbath keepers. They, they, they somehow stumbled upon the idea of the Sabbath. There was no Seventh Adventist Church there. There was no Seventh Day Baptist Church there. But they came upon it and they heard about him and said, would you come and hold lectures for us on the Sabbath? Jane Andrews, by the way, left the United States 150 years ago this year. 150 years. One of, the, one of the brightest stars that the Adventist Church has ever had. One of the brightest stars, an extraordinary individual. Wrote a great book on the Sabbath. If you have occasion, you can still find copies of it, reprints, get hold of that book. Jane Andrews responds that he will come. He goes to Germany and sure enough, there were 300 to 350 people 
who wanted him to come and lecture. I've done a lot of evangelistic meetings in different parts of the world, and when you have 350 people there, you're thrilled. But there was something unusual. Jay and Andrews lectured to 350 people, uh, Germans there, with them sitting there drinking beer and smoking. Now, when I've said that to some people, they were like, you know, well, surely he told them to stop smoking and drinking. No, he didn't. That's the way Germans lived at that time, and to be honest with you, some of them even today like that. He focused on what is important. Night after night, he lectured to that group of people because what was important was from the Word of God and not what they did. So you and I, in our outreach to people, need to always focus on what is important. We need to focus on the Word of God and the message that God gives. Change will come. We don't have to enforce it. Change will come. Secondly, we as an international body, we need to focus on the hope that we have. The hope in the return of Jesus Christ. Too many, too many of us have become enamored on the chatterboxes that are going on on the internet, the discussions on the issues and this issue and that issue. And I'm going to tell you something, most of those issues aren't going to save you or me. They're worthless. They, I'm not against the internet. I'm not against people posting stuff. But let me tell you something. Some of it is dangerous to our health and our spiritual well-being. The criticism that exists there is unbelievable sometimes. We need to focus on the promises of God. Jesus Christ promised he will come. Can we use that one? All right, how's this? Is this okay? Okay, let's start all over. Good afternoon. <laughs> Remember, four o'clock, so relax. I want you to relax. <laughs> I want you to relax. Just, just don't, don't, don't worry about it. We, we need to focus on what is important. What is important to me is, yes, Jesus Christ is coming back again. And it's not because what we do, but because what God promised. Sometimes we focus a little bit too much as if Jesus cannot return until we do this, this, and this. I don't believe that. Jesus will come at the appointed time. That doesn't mean that we should not be missionaries, that we shouldn't share our faith. I'm not saying that at all. But don't ever, don't ever pretend to think that we can prevent God from fulfilling his promise. He is the one in control. Jesus Christ came the first time even though very few expected him to come. He came at the appointed time, and Jesus Christ will come again. Our international family needs to keep that in mind. He will come. 1957, I was 10 and a half years old. Yes, I just had 80th birthday. I, I don't want you to do math while I'm trying to preach, so I'm just gonna give you the answer. January 19, 1957, my parents and I came from Germany as immigrants to the United States. We came to New York City, not on the Queen Mary or Prince this or Prince that, on a troop ship. That's how immigrants came in those days, on a gray painted troop ship. All they did is they took off the guns from the ship and put metal plates over where the guns used to be. Otherwise, the color was the same. We had the same bunks to sleep in, no staterooms. We had three or four or five bunks. Men and women were separated. The floor was metal. And during the night, when the ship was rolling and we went through quite a storm, the men were falling out of those cots on the floor and saying all kinds of nasty words. I did not have to worry because above me was a guy who was overweight, and he kind of pinned me down. 
And so I was safe. It's like having a human seat belt. We made it across, came to New York City that Saturday evening, January 19, 1957. We possessed two things, a suitcase made of aluminum from a shot down American airplane that my father made while we were in the concentration camp. And secondly, a little box. That's all we had. We got off the boat. They took us to the train. Any of you old enough to know what trains are? I know you young people, some of you don't know that. They took us to the train there, Penn Station, I think it was, and put us in the train, and we're sitting there. We don't know the language, and my father started looking at the train ticket, you know, the one that we were given for each of us. He said, there's something wrong. I said, what's wrong? I don't see the word Baltimore. We were destined to go to Baltimore. Baltimore at that time had a quite a large German population. Immigrants usually end up going to cities or places where there are other similar immigrants. Isn't that true? That's not unusual. So my father said, something is wrong here. So he found a lady, a Red Cross worker who spoke German. He said to the lady, there's a mistake here on our ticket. She said, why? Well, it says, doesn't say Baltimore here. Well, she said, let me check. She, like a good bureaucrat, went through her clipboard there, and she said, well, you're not going to Baltimore. Where are we going? Uh, she said, you're going to Richmond. My father said, Richmond. Where is Richmond? Uh, Virginia. He said, where is Virginia? <laughs> and she explained to us. Somehow our papers got mixed up with somebody else's papers. We came the morning of January 20th, Sunday morning to Richmond. They made arrangements with somebody to pick us up. And they picked us up, took us to their house, rented us a couple of rooms at a high rate. And there we are. We didn't know the language. We didn't know anybody in that community at all. The man asked us, what church do you belong to? Well, we were not Seventh-day Adventists. We were Sabbath keepers and similar in many ways, but we were not members of the Seventh-day Adventist church at that time. But he called the pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And that Friday night, that pastor, Stuart R. Jane, came to visit us. Our first reaction was, how are we going to talk to this man because we don't know the language? Fortunately, or maybe God planned it that way, his wife was German-born, came to the United States when she was about 18 or 19. And so she translated. God does things in an interesting way sometimes, doesn't he? And I still remember that Friday night as we sat there, we talked, and we enjoyed the visit, and he said, tomorrow we'll come and pick you up and take you to church. Sometimes the most important thing that you can do and I can do is pick up somebody and take them to church. It's the most important thing. And I remember going to what used to be called the Richmond First Church, now called the Patterson Avenue Church. It still stands there. I remember going there. I just heard noise. The language was foreign. We didn't understand anything. But for the worship service, Mrs. Ruth Jane. Ruth is a good name. Ruth is a, those of you who know us, you know what I'm talking about, right? Ruth is a good name. And Ruth Jane sat among us there and translated for us. That was my first day in any church that I ever attended in my life. And I fell in love with the Adventist church that day. International, that may be important. You and I didn't have much choice. How we look, where we were born, what languages we spoke, and all of that. But what we do have a choice is to say yes to Jesus Christ. That is the most important thing in our life. Ellen White has a statement that I want to share with you. It's a wonderful one. As members of the body of Christ, all believers are animated by the same spirit and the same hope. Did you hear that? 
As members of the body of Christ, all believers are animated by the same spirit and the same hope. I've had the privilege to probably go to some 75 or 80 countries on behalf of my work that I was doing when I was at the General Conference for various things, preaching, teaching, and so on. One occasion, I was asked to go and to teach a group of South Sudanese pastors. If you know your history, if you know, if you listen to the news, Sudan has gone through horrendous, horrendous problems in the last several decades. Now it's South Sudan and Sudan, two separate countries. I was there once when it was one country, then two. But when it was separated, they did not allow me to go into South Sudan. They brought the passes I was to teach into Arua, Uganda, way in the northern tip right near Sudan. And I want to tell you something. Those pastors have been, were isolated for many, many years. Sudan did not have much contact with the rest of the world. And we spent the time together going over the history of the Reformation and what it means to us as Seventh-day Adventists. That experience taught me once more the importance of belonging together to the same Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what the language is, no matter how we look, no matter what we do. I still have in my mind a vivid picture of those students in that classroom. I remember a couple of them in particular because they were so isolated from so many people sitting there and whenever I looked in their direction, they were looking at me and listening to what I was saying. We became together a body in Jesus Christ even though some of them, their English was very limited, even though we had never met before. And to this day, that experience taught me, helped me to understand the importance of God's people around the world. I still value those individuals, brilliant students who were isolated for so many years, who they had very little contact with the rest of the world, the eagerness with which they were learning and discussing and praying together. Yes, it's good to celebrate. It's good to celebrate our heritage. But most important is to focus on the promise that Jesus Christ has given to us. Young Mary, Jane Andrews' daughter, only lived about two years after she wrote that letter. Young teenage girl died at about 17, 17 and a half years old. She's buried today in the cemetery in Rochester, New York, the same cemetery where the well-known civil rights leader of the, of the 1800s, Frederick Douglass. How many of you know, have heard of Frederick Douglass? If you haven't, phenomenal American that you need to read a biography of. They're both buried there. Mary Andrews is waiting for the resurrection from the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I, whoever we are, however old or young we are, we place our hope in the Lord. We celebrate our heritage, but only because Jesus Christ makes us important. So leave today this place of worship knowing that you and I are number one in God's, eye, God's eyes. Amen. All right, if you've been blessed today, by this service. Say a big amen. 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 All right, please stand with us as we read responsively. We, we are, are many. many. We are one. We are one. We are unique. We are one. We have conflicting ideas, opinions, and interests. We look past selfish inclinations to see and attain that which is good for the whole. 
We sacrifice selfish passions, preferences, and prejudices to find and build on common ground. We emphasize our commonness, the things that hinge us together, instead of dying on hills that divide us. This is Appleton, with Jesus as our guide. We are a church that walks in a manner worthy of its calling. We are Appleton and look forward to standing on the sea of glass before God's throne together. Oh, 